Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Late Morning Program with Nam Ross Podcast, the number one Hare Krishna podcast in the world, I like to say. I'm not, I'm not sure even sure if it's true, but <laughs> I just say it anyways. Um, but I have Mahatma Prabhu here on. Uh, Mahatma Prabhu, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, happy to be here. I'm a great, great fan of yours. Oh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, so, Mahatprabhu, you are very well known in our society. So, I'm just going to get straight to the point here uh, okay, of this true. podcast. Of this podcast. So, I just want to make a comment that I have not seen the devotee community as divided as I have seen it in 2021 and 2020. And I just want to know from you if you could comment on that. If you could kind of get some insight on that. How do we deal with differences of opinion, uh, whether it be political, whether it be a, a part of, uh, it could be about COVID, could be about masks, could be about vaccines, it could be about anything. But devotees need to talk about why it's so, we are so, uh, why are we are so divided? If you could please comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe with COVID, we have too much time to think. <laughs> we home too much, you know? because right. sometimes uh, you know I've got nothing to think about, so controversy is interesting. So let me like you know, I think that's part of it a little bit. You know, um, it's not something that you generally see when we're at a festival or we're on Parikrama. You know, it's right. Kind of, so that could be part of it. You know, and yeah. I think our lives are a little boring, and so con you know, look at the media. You know, if, if it's not controversial, your show goes under. Since, you know, what they said, since Trump has left, like the ratings are going down on the newscast because there's, right. like, there's nothing juicy now because <laughs> he's gone. He was really good for their ratings. Um, it also may be that the events, we have certain events that are a little more controversial, but I always, I always wonder why would you want to get your mind into something controversial unless it's really essentially important to the welfare of our movement? Otherwise, right. you know, wouldn't you rather think of Krishna and Krishna Leela and, and the conditioned souls? And the, <laughs> it, it's so interesting, you know, because we all think we're the smartest thing that ever hit the planet. So whatever we think is, of course, true, right? <laughs> Isn't it? And, you know, Nam Ross, what do you think about this? And you think exactly what I, uh, the opposite of what I think. Oh, go, oh uh, I don't like you anymore, you know? Yeah. So then, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's what, you know, online we see devotees arguing so much about different things. And it's like, makes me think. And even about like, even the elders of our movement, as far as like, for example, Vaishnavi, Diksha Gurus or something. Like if we can't come to a, a conclusion on something, or if we do come to a conclusion on something, how do we expect the younger generation right. to take on, you know, yeah. the the society and and the mood of the elders if if they themselves can't kind of like come to an agreement about something? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Take on the mood of the elders. You have to go to debating school. You know, that's <laughs> what they're doing. So one one of the first things that struck me many many years ago when I heard a a critique, well, that's being polite, a criticism of one of the leading devotees in our movement was, we have to respect the intelligence of that devotee. He's doing something innovative in his preaching, and it was being criticized because it hasn't been done before. Right. All right, I can understand why it's criticized. Yeah. In my experience in ISKCON, it, because I joined in 1970, Every time there was something new, it wasn't evaluated whether it was good or bad. It's just it's new, it's bad. It was right. like immediate, immediately, you can't do that. Why? Because we've never done it. But, you know. So it's like okay, if if that's the criteria for being bad, it's never been done before. We're in a sad situation. So this devotee is being criticized, and my just gut intuition was not to analyze whether what he was doing was right or wrong, but to give him the benefit of the doubt of being a devotee at this point, he'd probably been a devotee 40 plus years. 
and having very a lot of success in preaching, give him the benefit of the doubt that he's you know, sincere, he knows what Prabhupada is teaching. He's thought about this a lot. And 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 the other thing, which was which is really bad, is that person, and we see this a lot, you don't talk to the person to get their opinion, you just criticize them. Right. So you, you don't you give them a chance to say anything about what yeah. he's doing. And how can you represent them if right. you if you don't even know what they're thinking? So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, wait a minute. Um what happened? We threw that verse out the window. We erased it or something. You know, took it out of Shishastakam. We don't need it anymore. So that's what I find interesting. That that it's it's that challenge of okay, I don't agree with this, but should I lose respect for this person because he doesn't think like I think? That seems to be some some very flawed way of looking at the world and especially um and we wouldn't expect that uh, amongst devotees so sometimes i look at this debating and i think it's just really degrading into something not uh, less than sattvic and it's it's unhealthy and like you said it's it's a bad example so that yeah, but totally i mean bad. yeah i understand that point as far as sometimes we hear devotees who say Okay, we want to. We're debating this because it's a de it's a deviation from what Prabhupada Prabhupada's program yeah, was. Right, right, we right. want to stick as much as to Prabhupada as we can because you know we're just representing him. We're the yeah. via media. That's the way yeah. it should be done. And yeah. so, to point out someone's who, someone who's doing something wrong or deviant, right. then that's our duty to do that, is it not? Right. Yeah, wrong according to who. Right. That's part of the problem. I have a story, I think, which will help. Not exactly, yeah, but I think this is, it's really an important point. Wrong according to who? So because it's wrong according to you, that means it's it's wrong. And I've, I've understood Prabhupada correctly. Of course, the person who made the adjustment will think, no, actually, you're wrong because you didn't change and you should have changed and probably would have expected you to change because adjustment is a principle. But I'll tell a story. Maybe it'll help us a little bit. Yeah. So Tamal Krishnamaraj was GBC in India and it was difficult and he wanted to go back to America and just get a break and preach. And he joined his old friend, Vishnu John Swami. And that was the beginning of Radha Damodar. I mean, it already started, Radha Damodar started, but it was just Vishnu John Swami on one bus. And um, after Tamal Krishnamaraj, it just it was all history. It built up like that, right? Right. So right. Prabhupada came to America, and he said, okay, okay, Tamal, let's, it's time to go back to India and be GBC. And, and Tamal Krishnamaraj said uh, to Prabhupada, he said, no, I don't want to go back. I'm preaching here. And Prabhupada sarcastically said, what's that? Preaching. You know, like, you know, it's just an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to go back and manage because it's difficult, but I need your help. And so I need you, so you have to come back. And then Tamal Krishnamar said to Prabhupada, no, I'll show you, I'll show you that preaching. So Tamal Krishnamar is very intelligent. So he already knew Prabhupada was going to do that. <laughs> so he had all the new devotees he made, maybe like 20 brahmacharis in saffron, shaved up, tilak, shika, everything. And he said, Prabhupada, I'll show you the preaching. And he, he said, just wait a minute. And he brought them all in and they came, paid obeisance. He's, he said, Prabhupada, this is my preaching. And Prabhupada just was beaming. He said, yes, this is preaching. <laughs> so I think, it's, I think it's, it's a little awkward if you would criticize Tamal Krishnamaraj, let's say, for disobeying Prabhupada when what he did was understand what Prabhupada really wanted and made all these devotees, you know, he's deviating from Prabhupada's order. You could say he's deviating, he's arguing with Prabhupada, but he goes deeper and he understands more deeply. So to say this devotee is deviating, maybe he's actually understanding more deeply what Prabhupada wants. And, and it's also funny. I think I, I find this really funny. A lot of times, the people who are the most critical are the ones who are not in the field, criticizing the ones in the field that are successful, which it's difficult to understand why they would do that. 
but from the, from the but, sidelines, basically criticizing. Yeah, when you're in the when you're in the field, when you're fighting a battle, you you make decisions, you know. Yeah. In real time. So when you're on the ground, you make decisions that may seem to someone who hasn't been on the field in you know thirty years to be deviating because we never did that when Prabhupada was there. But but if it's actually making people Krishna conscious, is it a deviation? If they're following the principles, chanting their rounds and so forth. Unless you're committing some sinful activity, how can you really call it a deviation? Mm. So you're saying, so you, you you said the words that you know what Prabhupada wants. Now, now because Prabhupada's not here anymore, how do we determine that? Because most devotees will not trust other devotees to say, "This is the decision that we're going to make," but and and they won't trust them to say, "Okay, that is what Prabhupada would want." Okay, I think, I think. In a sense, this gets to the core of the argument because Prabhupada wants many things and we're all different. And what he wants me to do, maybe not is not what he wants you to do because I'm not capable to do what you can do. And maybe I have capabilities you don't have. So how he inspires us is going to be different. So if he inspires you one way and I say, no, that's not what he wants. Um, don't you think that's a little arrogant of me? Now, you know, if you're doing something deviant, it's something he never asked anyone to do, or it's not having any effect, then, okay, maybe we can say that. But again, we go back to, let's, Prabhupada was very practical. L let's look at the result, you know, yeah. let's see, what, what are you doing? And I think, you know, part of the core of this argument is how you're being inspired. Like, like for example, I was part of a discussion about Varnashram. And so there was a, a Varnashram community and and there were some women there who were saying that, you know, what's going on in society today with women, feminists, and they're very liberal and they're working and so on and so forth. Uh, we don't want to do that. And nobody disagreed with them. It's just that not every woman wants to do that. So even the women that don't want to do that didn't disagree with them. It's just that they didn't want to, they, they understand, that's great. You want to stay home with your kids. Who's going to argue with that? You yeah. know, but I have like three PhDs and I, you know, this is my dream since I was in the womb to be the head of, you know, the Department of Religion at, you know, Harvard. And I'm on my way to do that. And I have no doubt at whatsoever that Prabhupada would ever say, no, don't do that. Just go home and take care of your husband. There's no way he would say that. Right. And so, and to the other girls who are taking care of their husbands and having uh, children and being very good wives and maintaining that culture, you'd say, fantastic, you know? And you can churn butter also if you really get into it and have your own cows. And he would go that direction. So, you know, it's, the, it's I find it kind of like very, I don't want to use the word egocentric because it sounds demeaning, but to think that the whole world has to be the way that I relate to my Prabhupada, it's not going to spread Krishna consciousness. And I understand that we all relate differently and it, what works for me may not work for you. Let's talk about that a little bit because we see in the society that things are very rigid because that's how they were developed and that's how they were instituted as far as the regulated principles, the way we okay. dress, the way the worship goes on, and etc. So how do we navigate such rigid Prabhupada being you know seemingly conservative, but also at the yeah. same time showing also a very liberal side of, of himself. How do we okay. navigate that? Yeah. Right. Because you have to you need <clears throat> you See, here's the point. You need both because the world, nobody is entirely conservative or liberal. No, Nothing is left and right, yin, yang. You need both to balance themselves. Like, like I have programs where I preach and we have principles upon which we preach. And they're both liberal and conservative because they have to work together. So the conservative is <clears throat> those, <clears throat> excuse me, those are initiated, especially the Brahmins, they have to be exam exemplary because, you know, Prabhupada said that so many times, Brahmins must be exemplary. We have to have that core of devotees, right, 
who sets an example. So when people come to our programs, they can see this works. These people are actually doing this. They live this way. But at the same time, not everybody can do that. And if you make people feel guilty or shameful because they can't do that and you force them to come to a standard which is not their standard, it doesn't work. So you have to be with the people, our philosophy is be very accepting, be very inspirational, but accepting. Don't force them to come to a platform which they can't maintain. So now you have this balance. And if you have only this, well, my hand's not here. If you have only one side, you don't want just, okay, everybody do whatever they want and have a big party. And you don't want everyone being super, super strict and shunning uh, and being judgmental of those who are not. You need both. And when you have both, it's a perfect balance and it works. And there's this thing called polarity management, which is to manage the polarities so you get a synthesis. And if you actually look at the world and think about your life, like your marriage is a, th a synthesis between male and female, you know? Right. If, if, if you were just living with another guy, your house would look different. Your life would be different. <laughs> Everything would be different, right? Probably a lot of clothes on the floor and the dirty dishes, but, you know. So. Um, so that polarity, male, female, is something who we are married. We're always like, you know, your wife says, do this. And you're like, why do I have to do that? She says, because I need it like that. Why do you need it like that? So after you've been married like a while, you realize, okay, she's a woman. I don't really have to understand why she needs it. I just have to know she <laughs> needs it. And then it's like, okay, all right, I'll do that because that's what you need. Yeah. And she understands you. So I heard this. I heard this. Um, principle, which is beautiful, that anytime you go to one extreme or the other, it always fails. This is historically true, politically speaking, either extreme liberal or extreme conservative, it's a failure. And, I, and, and what they say is whenever you go to one extreme, it pendulums back to the other extreme because we're fed up with this form of government. Right, right. right. Okay. And, and, you know, politically like, okay, we're enough, enough of Trump, enough of Republicans, and, you know, you can predict it. There's a guy who predicts, just, you know, looks at the, you know, and he goes, okay, this term is going to be Democrats, you know? Right. So, um, and, and this is something I intuitively felt because I had the fortune of living in Los Angeles when Prabhupada was there for three months. So I got to go to class every day. I mean, what wow. an experience is that? I mean, I was only in the movement two years, 22, but still... By listening to Prabhupada's classes, it dawned to me, and I wasn't even thinking liberal or conservative, because at that time in ISKCON, we were all just one homogeneous bunch of right. extremely liberal people trying to become extremely conservative, basically. That's what we, we were hippies. <laughs> right. All of a sudden, like, we're, you know, celibate hippies, you know, like we were like a real, anyway. And, and so, but I listened to Prabhupada's lectures, and there was this realization not even like I was consciously looking at it that way, that it's so balanced. Because whenever he would say, be brahmachari, it's simpler, you know, et cetera, et cetera, he'd say, but if you, then the end of a lecture, you think, okay, it's all about brahmachari, and the end of the lecture, he said, but grihastha life, if you live in Krishna consciousness, then it's very nice. He would always, you know, and then our sannyasis would get up there, you know, 22-year-old sannyasis, and it would just be, Grihastha life is bad. Brahmacharya life is good. And there was no balance anywhere. And, I, you know, it was noticeable to me. It's like, wait a minute, something's wrong with this picture, right? <laughs> and then when those sannyasis, like, turned 50, like, I'm so sorry I gave those lectures. Can you, like, burn all those tapes, you know, if you find them and don't let anybody listen to them? <laughs> so, you know, they became more, they, we were out of balance. And I always saw him. Oh, Prabhupada was in balance. He had that, you know? Yeah. I, I think sometimes that, the way we react to certain differences are not necessarily that they're philosophical, but they're kind of a cultural thing as well. Like the yeah. way you were brought up. So example, yeah. someone from India who's living in India, who was brought up in India may have certain differences when it comes to, let's say, for example, uh, Vaishnavi Diksha gurus or something. And then in someone in America who grew up, they have also a certain view of it. So yeah. it, it is a lot about your cultural upbringing, isn't it? Yes. yes. It's, it's, you know, when you spoke to Garuda Prabhu, I listened to that whole thing. I oh, like cool. listening to him. And yeah, he said great. something that, that really caught me. Because, you know, it will catch me if it's something that I've studied and think about. Right. 
And he was talking about his interpretation, his Bhagavad Gita interpretation. And he made, I don't know if you even picked up on this, even though he, it was Maybe kind I didn't. of subtle. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> it's, you know, the word interpretation. And he said, he said, everything is an interpretation. You have to, that's, it's, it's a subjective world. You're interpreting everything based right. on your culture, your education, your knowledge, your experience, your level of Krishna consciousness. You know, what time you got up this morning is affecting, you know, the quality of your rounds affects you. Everything is your interpretation. That's why we disagree on certain things, even though it's there in black and white. So what you said is 100% the reality. And it's it's something I find fascinating, beyond fascinating. <laughs> here, here, you know, I, because I'm I'm like social psychology, it just interests, interests me. Yeah. So much. It's just something. I was probably a social psychologist in my last hundred lifetimes or something. I find it so interesting. Or just being part of an organization for so many years. You said, you know, in India, they have a certain culture, so they think a certain way. I was in India last year. I left March 17th or March 18th. I, so it's all been a year. And I was with some devotees. In, I left from Bangalore. I was with some devotees there. And it was just after the GBC meeting. So they're asking what was happening with the female Diksha Gurus. Right. And I was telling them, I said, you know, this has been on the books that, that they can give initiation. And, and, and the devotees were like, ah, ah. <laughs> you know, these are devotees I know. These are friends. And one of them was my disciple. So he kind of didn't say much, you know. <laughs> I was saying, look at, you know, this is what the GBC decided. These are the reasons they decided. I wasn't saying it was good or bad. I was just... Right. I don't want to go there. I was just saying this is what they decided. And they were just like, it was like there wasn't a compartment in their brain for it. It's just like, it's not their culture. It's like, how do you get that woman as a guru? And it's so funny. Hello, you have women gurus in India all over the place. But still, you know, for a traditional religious movement, there was no compartment for it. So I think that was obvious because the major opposition to this is India. All right. Right. And like you said, what what is so fascinating to me is that it's a philosophical issue and all the people who disagree are from one country. How could that be a philosoph if that's a philosophical issue, that means all the people from that country are either smarter than everybody else or less intelligent than everybody else. But as you rightly said, it's filtered through culture. And so we don't even know we have these filters. And that's why to us, this is just, it's just true. And how could anybody not see it? Never say that. I can't understand. How do you believe that? <laughs> right, right, right. That's your culture. I still struggle with the fact that devotees can say, you know, we, we want to stick to Prabhupada's, you know, speaking, you know, I do. I'm guilty of this. I post sometimes on Facebook a quote that Prabhupada said that he wrote in a purport that's kind of controversial and very conservative, and I like to spur conversation about it. And I get a lot of flack for that. That why did you post that quote? Uh, you know, this is something that's very conservative, and this is uh, probably you know. But, it, but 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 what what irks me is that why can't we take Prabhupada's words? And try and and I'm not trying to twist someone's like idea of something. I'm just trying to share what Prabhupada's words are on something. But they think, oh, you're going to disturb the mind of the devotees and things like that. Like, what do you think about that? Is that something? I I'm not trying to disturb devotees' minds, but it is. Maybe I am a little bit, but maybe. <laughs> but, it, but do you know what I'm trying to say? You you um, well. I think a good way to do that, and I think everybody is dealing with this, is what did he mean by this? Because this right. doesn't seem consistent with who he is as a person and consistent within the larger body of his literature. And it's it's an important question. What did he mean? And a hundred devotees could tell you a hundred different things, or at least ten different things. And you know, as Krishna Das Kavar I said, the discussion. Don't run away from the discussion. We need to have the discussion to strengthen right. faith. So, you know, some 
there was a video put out by uh, one lady who's no longer a devotee. She was born a devotee. And, um, you know, looking at those statements at face value. Right, right. And, and um, you know, it's unfair, like we said, you know, discuss that with senior people, understand context, understand the the ways Prabhupada applied it, and then let us discuss it. I think this is extremely important because for us as Prabhupada disciples, we got to see how he applied things. And, and if you didn't see that and you just heard Prabhupada speaking or read his books, you might think, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I could surrender to this person. I don't know if mm -hmm. I could accept everything he said. But when you saw it in action, you could see, I guess maybe I didn't fully understand it or it's in a context which is totally not applicable today, which is why he's not applying it that way. You start to understand it better. And so it doesn't like throw you off. Having said that, I can honestly admit that Prabhupada did say things that I heard when I was a young devotee that I couldn't, there was no place in my brain for it. I didn't know how to process it. Mm. And so you'll ask me, how did you process it? And I said, I shoved it in a corner of my brain and locked it up and put a, a black cloth over it because I didn't know how. But that was to prevent myself from being offensive because I just knew that I don't have the capacity to understand that. And I know what Prabhupada said is, it, it's got validity. I just don't understand what it is and I can't process it. And so lately we've been having discussion. I'm on this group called Sabha and, and this topic came up. And um, Bhadrinayam Prabhu also, um, had start, I think, started this discussion. He said, we have to talk about these things, but we have to be able to explain them within the context of everything Prabhupada said or did so they're understandable. You know, just like um, I was telling a devotee today, I said, I was telling my wife, I was saying, you know, a big controversial statement which, which just drives her crazy. That women are less intelligent. And I said, well, you know, in China, it's about 90% women. Um, it's I just gave a class in Russia. I think it was like 108% women. No, it can't be 108%. It was probably... 95% women. Oh, wow. um, it, in South America, 85% women. So I was joking with her and I was saying, you know, Prabhupada says, if you don't surrender to Krishna, you're less intelligent, right? Which therefore means if you do surrender, you're more intelligent. So it seems like 85% of the Chinese women are potentially more intelligent than men or 85% more intelligent, however you want to. So, you know, it's like you have you have to understand things. Okay, what did Prabhupada mean? Maybe I misunderstood what he meant by that. Maybe, maybe this needs to be discussed. And as you talk about it, and as you hear from senior women, and as you hear from men who are scholars and deeply understand Shastra, you start, oh, he didn't mean it the way we think he meant it. He meant it this way. Like, you know, the less intelligent quote, it's always in the context of protecting women from these awful men who want to exploit them. So, you know, we all have this experience of, uh, well, anytime a man exploited a woman in our movement, Prabhupada never blamed the woman. He blamed the man. He said, women are innocent. It's your fault. The man who's exploiting them is supposed to protect them. Why? Because women are innocent. So my understanding was women are innocent. Therefore, they're prone to be exploited by men who say, I love you when they don't. And they get you pregnant and they go away. So, you know, when Prabhupada says less intelligent, he means they're, I don't want to say naive, but they're, they don't understand when a man says, I love you, when he does and when he doesn't. And therefore, they need to be protected from these men, which is, of course, we all agree. So I tell my wife, if you know, when it says less intelligent and people ask you, what does that mean? So it just means women should be protected, which they're all happy with. So, it, you know, you have to see it. And at least that's my part of my explanation. You have to see it in a context. So we were talking about that and said, well, we need. 
I think Garuda, Garuda Prabhu said it. We need books to explain these things because, you know, they're difficult to explain. And, and even now, even senior devotees will explain things like, how do you explain the rape thing? And so Garuda Prabhu explained it. And some devotees said, yeah, that's one way to explain it. But, you know, it's not the only way. <laughs> so, you know, these are like... <clears throat> These are difficult topics. You know? They are. I, something that doesn't sit well with me is that why do we have to try to, like, how far can you take that to explain his words? Like, you can take it and spin it to whatever you want it to say. Essentially, you can. I can write a book and say, this is what he meant. This is what he meant. This is what he meant. It's completely off the right, it's completely right. off the what what he actually meant to say so why don't we just take the books for what they're meant to say and accept that instead yeah. of trying to make excuses about this is what he, he wanted to say i'm playing yeah. de devil's advocate here yeah well it goes back to the same problem take the books as they're said according to who so the idea in explaining okay Prabhupada said this what did he mean by this okay let's see the other 100 things he said about this so we can come to a conclusion. But if you're just taking that one statement, right, uh, and then, okay, it's your interpretation. You can say whatever you want. Well, he meant this, and rape means that, and less intelligent means this. And, you know, well, what, let's, and it wasn't even Prabhupada who said less, it was, it was Manu. You know, you got a problem with less intelligent, go talk to Manu. He's the one who said it. <laughs> Prabhupada being, you know, Prabhupada being a representative of Shastra, he's just repeating it. But Prabhupada's repeating it in a context where he where he's seeing women being exploited and where they should be protected you know so that's that's what's going on in his heart when he's saying it but we hear it it's like oh racist right you know i like no a pure devotee can't be racist you know so you have to establish the <laughs> ground rules pure devotees are not racist okay you got that okay once we got that <laughs> then we go to the next thing you know when he right. says this, it's not racist that's not where his heart is believe me you know he he sacrificed his life to save these people so you know so when you put everything in then you see it and you go okay the problem is you can't understand that in that one sentence because it's just one sentence in a purport women are less intelligent and it's like so we recognize it's a problem. And in my prediction, I was going to write a book, 2084, probably never write it. But if I ever do, this one prediction will be in there. When the copyrights are over, there will be republication of Prabhupada's books with chosen purports and sections left out. It's just going to happen. I know that. Because really? You think that's going to happen? Definitely, 100%. It's already, already now people are not using Prabhupada's Gita in their in their preaching programs because of statements right. like that because they're losing people that's a controversy in and of itself i'm not saying it's right i'm just saying i'm 100 percent sure that's going to happen because people like i don't want to give someone a bhagavad gita that says this about right. women because we're going to lose them um um it it so, you know, these are realities that we are preachers, we're dealing with the world. I know many preaching programs that just feel that these people are not ready for Prabhupada's Gita. Now, that sounds like a heretical statement. Right. And these are done by, you know, Prabhupada men, and Prabhupada women. It's just their experience. So someone will say, it's his words, they've always been there, it made so many devotees, you know, you're just a sissy. And someone else will say, I've seen too many young women not come back to our programs because of that and i don't want and i'm concerned they would be have become devotees if we just could have taken the time to explain that but since they saw that it was too late because like all our women when they come uh when people come if you if you can explain things then they'll understand and you can explain Prabhupada's heart and the context and the culture and the transition you know where this comes from I mean, every religion has this problem, this traditional cultures, you know, being impl implemented, you know, like this plant is being planted in America. Isn't it, growing. isn't it that, isn't it, when I hear that, it makes me think, aren't we putting like a material impediment on bhakti? Like if you're saying that woman never came back, the impediment being she read something in the book that didn't resonate with her isn't that her own isn't that just her sukriti's not there yet to to accept that 
why, why does it have to be why does it have to be like like the the blaming on on the Prabhupada's books thing it you know that little part of it which i do i understand that completely that you know people don't come back because of that mm-hmm. and but i just don't understand why uh you know they'll they'll be able they'll have to run into that eventually if they do again end up joining and the, you know yeah. they ha- they have to come in they're going to have to uh, enter it even in like in um interacting with devotees maybe they might someone might tell oh you're less intelligent or this or that so like maybe it's do you know what i'm saying yeah yeah oh it's a it's a strong argument for sure and um i would say that it's something topics like this i personally feel are extremely important to discuss and we haven't discussed them enough in iskon you know we haven't even discussed what is the reaction to Prabhupada's books this book that book we don't even have we haven't even done research the only people who can tell you are the book distributors or the preachers right. on college campuses who right. get feedback <laughs> and i preached on college campuses for years and i heard what they said but there was no system where send that feedback to the bbt they're going to discuss this you know mm. um when rameshwar was in charge of bbt it was more like that he was he was really in touch with what was going on in the world and um he published those books life comes from life higher taste um chant to be happy um, right to be more in line with where people were thinking and uh, there was no women or less intelligent in those books so you know i don't have the quote for this but agni dev prabhu if you ever see him you can ask him told me that prabhu said preaching means what to say and what not to say Mm. So, so here's my little joke. I have a character called Bakta Burfi. Bakta Burfi messes everything up. He's the, he's the, you know, he's Nama, Nama, you know, Nama Niyama Brahmachari. Of the yes, community. yes, of course. Hilarious. He, he's worse than that. He, <laughs> because he's more raw, he's newer. Right. And so he gives a Sunday feast and he's like, okay, I'm giving the Sunday feast. Three topics. Um. Women are less intelligent. We didn't go to the moon. And if you eat meat, you're going to hell. You know, so that's <laughs> Bakta Burfi, right? Now, are those things true? Well, let's say for the sake of this, this discussion, we'll just say, okay, those things are in our scripture. The Prabhupada did say these things. Whether it's exactly he meant it, how he meant it. Okay, that's another thing. That's too nuanced for Bakta Burfi, right? Right. So if... If sometimes we've seen very, what I would say, sincere people doing very well in Krishna consciousness, and then they meet the wrong devotee, and you never see them again. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> like they met Bhakti Burfi's cousin or something, you know. Right. Or Bhaktin Burfi. It's mostly Bhaktas. Then Bhaktis <laughs> are probably a little better. <laughs> Not so fanatical. So. I think there's a balance between both. It could be that, yeah, she's just not ready. She doesn't have the Sukriti. But I always felt as a preacher, if I think like that, then it's like, well, you know, I'll just sit outside and, you know, chant Hare Krishna and, you know, who's ever sincere will just, they'll walk in the temple, you know, and they'll become right. the center, like whether I talk to them or not, whatever I say or not, however I treat them or not. Do you realize that in 1972 in L.A., if you wanted to become a devotee, you had to live in the van in the parking lot for a week to test your sincerity? Did you know that? No, I didn't. A van. I don't know if the van, like I don't know where you put all your stuff during the day or if the van was just broken down. Right. But you can ask some devotees who joined if you ever meet them. Uh, if you ever happen to meet them, if someone says, I joined in L.A. So, was it 72? Did you sleep in a van? <laughs> and... Um, you know, and then in 1975, Tosi Das was the president, Donovan Marsh was there, and Tosi Das got this idea and said, we should have a program for new people where we take care of them, where they have their own place. And that year, 100 people joined. Prior to that, maybe four would join a year. Half of them didn't stay, but 50 people stayed because, wow. because we took care of them. We let them stay as guests. We let them stay for days as guests. We had this Bhakta program that basically baby fed them. And so, you know, and we had the Bakhtin program. So, and we had mature, you know, very mature devotees dealing with them. You wouldn't have Bakta Burfi in charge of that. You'd have, and, and so it worked. 
So for me as a preacher, I always think, what, what makes the most sense without, you know, okay, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to compromise what's in the Shastra, but if you're not ready to hear it, what's what's the point of telling you? Does it really matter? Right. Um, I wonder, I, this is just a hypothetical question, and we can't answer it. If I went to Prabhupada in 1976 and said, Srila Prabhupada, I've been preaching for six years, and I have counted a hundred women who were about to become devotees who read that women are less intelligent and they left and we've never seen them again. And I've done the math and I, I think at that rate, if I preach for the next 10,000 years, just me, you know, or all, I can, let's say I make an estimate of ISKCON preaching, there's probably 1 million souls who will not take to Krishna or 10 million souls. I wonder what Prabhupada would say my intuition he's, is he would say, then take it out of the books. And I'll tell you why. Because Prabhupada was not a fanatic. And Prabhupada's heart was with people and what, and he would do what would help them. Hayagriva found something in the books and he said, Prabhupada, I don't think, I think this will work against us, against our movement, against helping people. It was what was seen as a racist statement and Prabhupada said, take it out. Based on that, we... All of us, as Prabhupada disciples, are lamenting um, from probably the day Prabhupada left, but, it's, but it gets worse every year, I think. Why didn't we ask him these questions? You may have heard interviews. Have you ever heard interviews from what he say? Why did I ask him this question? It was like, it was such an obvious question, but we... Yeah. So, you know, this issue didn't come up so much. Women less intelligent. Some, you know, we just... We were like a tractor, just like knocking down the forest, you know. We weren't really, it was just like, you know, establishing the movement, opening temples, and a lot of these social issues, they they were there, but they just, they never got in the forefront. You know, nobody mm -hmm. wanted to talk about them. And I think that's like questions you're asking. I think that's the problem. We're not talking about them. And we should, you know, we should be talking. Like, how do we deal with this? Your question is like, is it Sukriti? Is there anything we can do? Is it tough luck? You just go on, you know, give them the sauce, you know, be the lion guru. <laughs> right. and, and, you, and, you know, ultimately the answer to your question is it doesn't even matter because everybody's going to do preach the way they preach anyway, according right. to what they think is best. So you're going to get the lion guru who you wish you didn't bring your best friend to the temple that day to the Sunday <laughs> feast because your friend is like, oh, my God, don't ever <laughs> bring me here. Right. You want to hear a, a funny story? Sure. Um, uh, so I grew up in L.A. I went to school in Berkeley. I, I decided to become a devotee, and I came back for a Christmas vacation, 1969. So I was, like, all excited to tell my friends, you know, this is it. I found it, you know. And the temple was by car from my house three minutes or two minutes. Like, I live in Mayapur. The temple was closer, <laughs> like, than the Mayapur temple. We're faster to get Right. So I bring my friends over, right? Vishnu John's there leading Kirtan. It's the L.A. Temple, 1969. It was, you can't believe it because that was like the world headquarters. Right. But, so I call, I'm going to the temple the next day, and I call my friend, and I say, you want to come back to the temple? I'm going. There's no way I'm not going. I go, what happened? He goes, if I go back, I'll, be, I'll never leave. I'll become a devotee. I'm not going back. <laughs> so... You know, that's what we want, don't we? And yeah. You find out all the, we didn't go to the moon and women are less intelligent. When he's completely intoxicated on Burfi and Kirtan, you all know, you know, then it's like, yeah, whatever. I have, I believe whatever Prabhupada says. And I just know, maybe I don't understand it, but I have right. faith in it and I need to understand. So it's just a reality that preachers are going to preach according, like you said, their culture, their nature. You want to do something really, really interesting? Find Vishnu. There are little snippets of Vishnu John Swami. Audio. Speaking to non-devotees. There are these little snippets. Yes. And close your eyes and tell me that doesn't sound like the most cutting-edge preaching in the yoga communities in 2021. He really? Was, oh, yeah, totally. He was, he was, yeah, you have a little fun. I actually I have one on my phone. It's like... <laughs> Someone just sent it to me. 
Uh, yeah, I get these little clips every once in a while. That's yeah. Vishnu John Swami. That's he was he was like he knew how to just get right in to people's hearts and soften them up. And uh then you have Jayananda. Jayananda right. was like he didn't have to say anything. It's just who he was. People would see him and go, I want to be a devotee. I want to be like you. You know? So like I can't be like Jayananda. I wish I were. He was the personification of humility. You know, maybe in a hundred lifetimes I could get a particle of his humility. So we all have our capabilities. And then you have Gorka Vindamaraj, who's like, you know, so Namras, what do you say? What's that verse? You don't know that verse. What's wrong with you? You know, that's a, that's a, you know, a different style of guru, you know, slam, slamming, chastising, Chanaka says, chastise your disciple. So, um, and you're going to say, Gorka Vindamaraj, you know, could you calm down? You know, it's not, you know, <laughs> not going to work. It's not his nature, right? Right. But but the point, and then you get someone um, like Bhaktivedika Purnaswami, and he's talking all about culture and tradition, and it's like, wow, I didn't know that, I didn't know this, and some people are like, oh, this is this is like this is so irrelevant, and some people are like this is so fascinating, I just love this, <laughs> and 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 the reality is, you need everybody because there's. People like Gorgo Vindamaraj, there's people like Bhakti Vijay Purnaswami, there's people like Vishnu Johnson, you know, there's like, and so you, you, you're not going to make them who they're not. And, I, you know, of course, at your preaching program, you can decide which one you want to invite, right? Right. And you say, you know, Maharaj, if you come, please don't talk about A, B, and C. And sometimes devotees do that, you know, because they, yeah. well, they know what he's like. And say, could you just, this is our mood here, we try to do this, and it's like, okay. Or... I can't preach that way. No, I'm sorry, Maharaj, because you know this is the way we do it. <laughs> but, but it's a reality that because we're different, some people love Trump and some people hate him. You know, figure it out. You know, you're thinking, why would anybody love Trump? And the people love Trump, thinking, why would anybody hate him? I just can't understand. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. Because we're different. So I don't think we or anybody is going to make anyone different, but we will mature in our preaching and we will come together as seniors and as you and your generation is going to come together. And you have the advantage of looking at all the mistakes we made and all the problems we created and analyzing them. And I think your generation is going to talk about a lot more than we talked about. We don't, I believe we don't talk about enough. Yeah. We talk about more. There, there's always the, you touched on many points, but what stood out to me was that we have to meet people to where they can digest something, yes. not give them something that they can't digest. Like I have a little kid and he's, you know, five months and you can't give him, you can't like, you can't give him grains when he's like two months or whatever, whatever it is, because he can't digest. He can't. Yeah. So, so you're saying that we have to approach, or we have to give people what they can take. And then as, as time goes on, maybe even like you said, Prabhupada said, you know, preaching means what to say and what not to say. And what to say is like focusing on, you know, the chanting, the the prashadam, the 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 bliss that it gives, and less less on all these kind of like peripheral things. You know how Prabhupada used to say, you don't have to shave your head. You don't have to wear robes. Just chant Hare Krishna. You know? Right, right. And then it's like, and then, you know, three weeks later, Prabhupada sees the same person coming. So when are you going to shave your head? When are you going to move in? <laughs> right. He said that to one of my godbrothers. He had long hair. And he and he, he put his hand on his head and said, so when are you going to become a devotee? So time, place, circumstance, individual. Sometimes you need to be heavy with people. Otherwise, they don't go anywhere, right? But, right. but the expert preacher knows when to be heavy, when to be soft. What's... The, the whole idea is to encourage people. You know, the guru is supposed to chastise, but most of the time Prabhupada was encouraging and praising. <laughs> if you actually look at all his letters and his interactions with devotees, I mean, maybe, you know, more chastisement is going to be there with the people around him because he's relying on them. But in general, he's praising. He's not doing what Chanaka said, you must chastise, otherwise you'll spoil your disciple. So, um, and he, and if somebody did something stupid, he would let them know. But in general, he never said, oh, all you women, you're stupid, and all you guys, you're smart. A lot of times he said, oh, your wife's smarter than you are. 
You know that story? No. Dayananda. You know Dayananda? You yeah, know? yeah, Dayananda Prabhu. Yeah. He used to be in New York. Yeah. So he was married to a disciple. She's no longer alive. Uh, he was married to a lady named Nandarani. And they were in Tehran, and Prabhupada was with them. And Atreya Rishi was there. He's the GBC. And he said, Dayananda is very intelligent. Prabhupada said, yes, I know. But his wife is more intelligent. And then Atreya Rishi said, but I see how intelligent Dayananda is. He said, yes, but she's more intelligent. So it's like, it's like, you know, sometimes you're with Prabhupada, and it's like, there's no, there's no, it's exactly like this or exactly like that. It's everything's individual, you know. Everything is what it is for the situation and what will encourage the people and what's best for them. You know that story? He tells the sannyasi, stay here, don't leave, manage the temple. A yes. second later tells the next sannyasi, go. Yeah. go. He actually told Gargamuni, he said Gargamuni was divorced and Gargamuni was doing business and Prabhupada said he needs a wife, tell him he should get married again. Whoa. He actually said that. Right. He told one one of his servants was gay and he just couldn't control himself. He said, I right. need a friend. And Prabhupada said, then go live, go live with him. You know, it's not in his books, remarry. It's not in his books. If you're gay, go live with someone. But in that situation, <coughs> Then the funny story was Shruti Kirti was at Mangal Arti and Prabhupada pulled him out and said, never go to Mangal Arti because really? you're, my, you're my servant. You have to stay with me. Right. So, you know, it's like. It, I feel like we've frozen Prabhupada in time and then whatever he said at the specific time, whether it was in the books or in a conversation, it's frozen there. And if we want to kind of stray from that a little bit, no, because that's what he said, and that's what the letter was. That's what the purport was, and that's mm -hmm. where you have to keep it. So, how do we deal with freezing Prabhupada in time? We we essentially have to, you know, it has to be explained by someone. By by, yeah. you know, I always I always feel for me personally, and I share this with others. You you want to understand Prabhupada's heart as deeply as possible to be able to understand his instruction. What is his mood? And, and imagine, okay, if he were in this situation, what would he do? And our God brother, Guru Gauranga, he introduced me to something which is called a thought experiment. And this is so beautiful. I was telling him some of the things I was doing. He said, well, let's put this through a thought experiment. You have to go into Prabhupada and tell him, this is what you're doing. And what do you think he's going to say? Or you have to go into Prabhupada and say, this is what I'm preaching from your books, that I think this is what it means. Right. What do you think he's going to say? You're like, be open enough and honest enough, right? <laughs> are, you, are you really understanding what Prabhupada wants, what's in his heart? Because when you come up with, like you're saying, maybe I'm coming up with a conclusion that doesn't seem like what Prabhupada is saying. Right. Maybe it's closer. Look what Bhakti Siddhanta did. He was criticized heavily for deviating from tradition. And then Prabhupada even more from his god brothers. You know, you're allowing women to move in the temple and the Brahmins are saying you can't give Brahmins to Westerners. So, and then you look at Prabhupada's purports and he's like, no, this is Shastra. This is truth, you know? This deviation is not deviation. This is the heart of Shastra. Right. So, you know, it requires maturity to understand, you know, is this a principle or is this a detail? That's the key. And, 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 you know, also as we started, what I think the most difficult thing is when someone disagrees with us, can I respect their opinion? Can I honor? I say, well, I have to, I don't see it that way, but can I honor you? Can I at least respect you even though I disagree and not, and see that that's how you're inspired. And can I consider that? And I say, well, let me think about this. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe this is this is just me and my misunderstanding. Let me pray on it. Let me chant on it. Let me discuss it with other God brothers. I do that a lot with God. I say, this is how I think. What do you think? And sometimes they'll say, well, it's a little more like this. Mm. I go, oh, thank you. I didn't see it like that, right? 
And so that's the beauty of unity and diversity because we're all different. So we have different angles on the same thing. So it, it broadens our vision. I think, I think that, you know, that the trouble is when you think you are right, absolutely, 100% of the time, and that means those who don't agree with you are wrong. That doesn't smell like humility to me. To me, and it doesn't right. smell like like that is you know. You might even be right a hundred percent of the time, but if you're actually humble, you would be somewhat open to, you know, to discuss. Do you think what I'm saying is right? Um, I, you know, what do you say? So, you know, but it's right here. It's in the Shastra. It says it. Okay, we understand that. We represent Shastra. Most of the time, we get it right. Maybe sometimes we don't. Maybe we. Maybe someone else understands it more. You know, we have this problem in ISKCON that many of our God brothers went outside. Many devotees went outside. Right. And they heard from Narayan Maharaj. They heard from uh, Sridhar Maharaj and then his uh, the disciples. And generally, Gaudiya, Gaudiya Math, they're quite learned. I think the tradition just came down from Srila Bhakti, from what I've seen. They're quite scholarly. You know, yeah. Siddhanta is really, like, really important. Right. And so if you've ever read anything or heard from those devotees, sometimes they say something that's like, oh, I didn't understand that. It's like, oh, that solves that problem. I... I always preach this way, but I never understood it because it wasn't explained fully in mm. problems. So sometimes you have that problem also where someone goes more deeply into Shastra and they just understand it better, but it's not exactly the way Prabhupada explained it, but it's the way Jiva Goswami explained it. It's explained in this book, which nobody's ever going to read because, right. you know, you somehow or other heard it from so-and-so, who heard it from so-and-so, who, you know, was the only one who read that commentary, you know, or had the manuscript or something. Okay, we're exaggerating, but sometimes it's like that. And so I find sometimes that's where disagreement comes also. Somebody just knows it a little deeper, but it's not exactly the way Prabhupada explained it. But if you sat down with Prabhupada and you said, well, this is what Jiva Goswami says, and this is like, what, what's, he, what's he gonna say? He's gonna say, I'm not gonna say, I don't agree with that, right? It's just an elaboration. So, you know, you have to be a little open-minded I did a search for liberal in the Veda base, and you know what came up? It's a synonym for Mahatma. Prabhupada uses liberal as broad-minded, not wow. as we use it politically as kind of like degraded, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, or you know, like, you know, 30% of the Democrats are atheists or something like that. Right. Um, you don't find very few, if any, atheists on the Republican side. So we don't use it the same. That's how Prabhupada used it, liberal. And conservative is just conserve. It means to conserve tradition, conserve it. Right. You know, so like this discussion is so interesting because Prabhupada was the embodiment of both completely, right? Yeah. Making these vast changes, but keeping things intact. He didn't, he wouldn't shift 16 rounds, four principles, not going to mess with that, right? right? And other things, we're going to adapt. Because if we adapt, more people become Krishna conscious. And it's not going to minimize our purity if we adapt to it. If we do 16, if we stop the 4 and 16 for initiates, that's going to minimize our purity. The ticket back to God is validated with 16 rounds. If you don't want to chant 16, that's fine. Don't get initiated. No problem. That's the liberal side. But once you do, okay, this is the standard. Disagreement I made with Krishna. We can't, we can't change that now. But... Mm. You're not ready for it. Fine. I'm not going to beat you up. That's fine. No problem. And we're going to change these other things because this is going to help you. And it's not going to, it's not minimizing any principle. It's not keeping you out of Vaikuntha. It's getting you there. So that's the way I've understood it, you know? And I've tried to, to be like that, open minded, like Prabhupada. As best yeah. I, I, I like the point you made about respect for someone who doesn't have the same opinion as you. As Vaishnavas, we always hear the qualities being peaceful, silent, uh, respectful, humble things. But when I look online and I see what the kind of conversations devotees are having, it's the complete opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's just 
it, because they don't have the same opinion as someone else. They have a difference of opinion and they just want to argue about it. And I think that's what you're saying is just so fresh and so a breath of fresh air in the sense of that. Let's go back to what the original qualities that we were taught of a Vaishnava is, is to be mm -hmm. like that and not to, not to, you know, pull someone down because they have a, a, a different opinion than you. Yeah. Um, perfect. It's perfect. So I was, I was mentioning before something that's very common and I've noticed it in myself and I, I very much try to embody as much as I can what you said because I just feel that that's what Prabhupada wants us to be. And Prabhupada always said, cooperate. So how do you cooperate? You cooperate. have to be respectful to cooperate. And that was that was such an important statement for Prabhupada. Cooperate. You know, it was like, yeah. that is like, if we don't do that, Prabhupada said, we don't have a movement. So I always, I always thought, okay, he wants us to cooperate. So I have to figure out how to cooperate with people who have different opinions who do things differently. And then occasionally I would run into this situation where someone would say something. And I was like, how can he say that? That's ridiculous. <laughs> and then I was like, I don't want to see his blank face anymore. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. You know, But I'm looking at that and going, how did that? Why did what he say affect me that way too? Like I, you know, if I next year I go to Mayapur and I see him, I'm gonna run the other way. I just like I can't I can't be around people who think that way because I think the way he thinks is gonna destroy Iskon. And I think he's coming from like a, you know, he's still in the Satya Yuga and reading Manusamita, you know. Right. So <clears throat> and I'm seeing how I rile up. I rile up like that. And so then I ask other devotees, do you feel this way? And everybody's like, Yeah. I dislike them simply because they don't agree with me. <clears throat> um, you've heard of false ego, right? Well, that's false ego on steroids, I think. <laughs> you know, isn't it? You know, yeah, I don't sure. like you. Why? Because you don't agree with me. You know, that's a yeah. good reason. You know, so, uh, but that's actually what's happening, right? And I think for me, my realization after going through that, and and hopefully I'm getting better, was. The person I disagree with, I spend a lot of time trying to understand them because I think that's so important for me as a person to develop that ability to hear and important for the movement because maybe I'm not getting the whole picture. Uh, obviously, right. I'm not getting the whole picture because I tend to one side. How could I get the whole picture? He can give me the other picture. So, okay, so what you're saying is this, this, and that. Okay, let me think about it. Let me add that into my equation. Because it balances me out a little more. Because I, yeah. I'm like, you know, if I'm like, yeah, every girl should just get a PhD and go for it. And, like, and he's like, wait a minute, you know, if you actually look what's happening in the world, where the exploitation is happening, it's happening in the workforce, and and the kids are being neglected and they're ending up. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that, you know. Mm. My mother never worked, so you know, I didn't have another experience. And so then he enlightens me because that's not really our culture, and that's not, you know. And, and so now we have two polar opposites. Both have validity. But I wasn't thinking this side. So if I can just get my head around what he's saying, I don't have to necessarily give up what I believe or what I think is correct. But if I add that, it becomes more balanced. And here, here's what I find a, a problem to be. If I am not balanced and I'm teaching people, I will make them imbalanced. This is a... This is, I feel, a crime of every teacher. You can actually Wait, can you repeat that? So if you're if if you're not balanced, if you're teaching someone, then they will also become non-balanced. Because, because I will just focus on, you know, yeah, women should just go out there and do this and just you know, like get them out there, inspire them, let them go for it. And if they want to, you know, get married when they're 18 and have kids, just tell them you are so stupid, you know, you mm. right. That's imbalance because then everyone I talk to is going to think that way. That's not our philosophy at all, right? Our philosophy is more like encourage everybody according to where they're at. If you want to have a family and like that, that's that's our tradition. That's our culture. That's what you want. That's what we need. We need more mothers at home raising Krishna conscious children. This is fantastic. Um, but if financially you can't do that or 
you know, your wife's got, you know, she's just, it's not why she just can't stay home and sit, you know, she needs to get out and pursue. Okay, we understand that. We, we're not going to say there's anything wrong with you for doing that. So if I can present both sides, then everyone feels inspired and encouraged. But if I just mm -hmm. present one side because I'm one-sided, then I make the audience one-sided and the ones that won't go to my side just think I'm a jerk and they hate me because they right. think I don't, I'm such an unbalanced person. I shouldn't be sitting on this chair speaking. Isn't it? I mean, that's my personal opinion. I think it's a, it's a huge responsibility for speakers to be balanced. And when they're not, they're doing an injustice. And, and then they're creating polarities. And all right. of a sudden, I don't like him. I don't want to hear him because he's always talking about this. And, and the most successful preachers will be the ones who can talk about tradition and strictness and also talk about accommodation and innovation in one big um, polar um, a way that it's managed so it's like oh that seems to really work and then you've resonated with the center which is where most people are anyway right i really love that point that you have to if you want to you know as a speaker you have to be balanced or else the people who you, you'll either you'll either attract a certain type of people and then you repel a certain type of people and then those people repel they will criticize you for being a certain way etc were you always like this wisdom that you're kind of speaking of were you always like that since the beginning or did you did that develop somehow <laughs> because it's such a rare thing isn't it i mean like i don't know i can't answer that question i tend to think when i was a brahmachari I wasn't, but the people who know me and said, you know, they tell me I was a bit like that. I, you know, when I was oh, okay. 20, just become a devotee, not exactly like that. But I think it was there, and probably because of the climate in ISKCON, it got pushed down because it was so like, you know, just be yeah. brought to Charlie like that. Um, I think I think that's unfortunate that we had a culture that kind of tried to mold us into something different than who we were and it's you know we had we were forced to kind of suppress or it was suppressed for us in a sense yeah um but i i've obviously had to think about this in relation to Prabhupada saying cooperate as i was saying before it's like right, right. he wants me to cooperate how am i going to cooperate with these people you know and i have to learn to respect them and their culture and of course i lived in india so you understand the culture. You understand why people do things. And I, I've lived in the homes of so many Indians. And it's so much different than in the homes of Westerners. And I've lived in the homes of people in South America. And it's so much different. And, and, in, and I've lived in the homes of people in China. And it's so much different. And it just becomes obvious we're products of our culture. Right. And so you have to respect that. One of the things that I do, and I, and I would suggest all teachers do this, if you're going to give an opinion on something which you know may not be appreciated by everyone, or it may not be the way everyone would understand Prabhupada if you feel it's a little narrow or maybe too liberal or whatever, but you believe this is true, say, this is the way I understand it. Not everyone will understand it. This has worked for me. This is the reasons I understand it this way. This is how I apply it. If, if that doesn't work for you, I understand that. You know, mm. I think that's honest. I think that's fair. And it works for me and it's helping me in my Krishna consciousness. So, so, but that's for me. You know, I go on Japa walks, I walk really fast. It helps me control my mind. And Satyananda Maharaj will say, You're nuts. You need to sit down and just, right. <laughs> he's like, Maharaj, I can't sit down. He goes, you're full of passion. He goes, I know I am. And <laughs> at least but when I'm walking and passionate, my mind slows down a little bit. It's like, okay, it works for you. And Maharaj will say, okay, hopefully I'll pray for you someday. You're older, you can sit down because it will get better. <laughs> but, but so Maharaj will say, for me, this is what I found. You know, I found that sitting down, being in this consciousness, sitting this way and so forth, this is what works. And um, is it absolute? Does it work for everybody? That you'll have to find out. So I think that's there's some necessity of that sometimes, not all the time, because sometimes we're just preaching Shastra. It's not me, you, anybody. Right. But sometimes it's an application or it's a nuanced understanding and say, 
this is how I understand it. I've heard other people say it differently. They've said this and that. Um, that is not my understanding based on this and that. This is what I offer you. So, you know, the guru is supposed to be absolute and just, you know, not nuance it, but the world is nuanced. This Acharya said this. This Acharya said that. Okay. What is it? It's both, right? Yeah. It worries me. It worries me that this mood of knowing Prabhupada's heart and how he operated is going to be something that is potentially going to be extinct with your generation mm -hmm. in some ways. Because yeah. we didn't meet him. We didn't know what he operated on. All these stories you're telling about, okay, he said this to Rameshwar and he said this to uh, this devotee and, and it was a uh, you know, detail and things like that. You go another few generations from now, we're not going to have that at all. So how yeah. do we deal with the? How do we deal with that kind of uncertainty? Read every biography you get your hand on. Read every memory video you get a hand on. Grab every Prabhupada disciple you can. Tie them to a chair and say, "Tell me." It recorded. Tell me what, what was Prabhupada's mood? And you're going to obviously hear different things from different devotees because Prabhupada right. had was multifaceted, but. The more we understand about Prabhupada, the more we can use that information in application. I think the most important thing, what I would share, is that Prabhupada suffered to see people suffer. Right. And he was kind of, in a sense, I don't want, you know, I have to qualify this, willing to do anything. You know, obviously not willing to compromise Krishna consciousness, change the philosophy, but willing to do whatever was po allowable to do to help them become Krishna conscious. Like, for example, when the devotees were going to go to Eastern Europe, and they said, Prabhupada, there's nothing to eat there but meat. And Prabhupada said, and eat meat. So he would go to that extent to save people. I mean, the communist world for Prabhupada was like, if you conquer that, this is like the icing on the cake of spreading Krishna consciousness. He was so into that, right? Wow. Uh, when we wanted to wear Western dress to distribute books, it was we never did that. And, and there was a controversy about it. You know, we're dressing up. It's a compromise. We, you know, we look like hippies again. And you know how Prabhupada was convinced? The GBC, who was promoting that we should dress this way, told Prabhupada, said, whatever you want, we'll do. But I just want you to know, if we wear Dodi Korta, the book distribution, in my estimation, will decrease 50%. Within a nanosecond, Prabhupada said, then wear Western dress. That was it, you know? So I think we need to understand that about Prabhupada, that his heart was his heart was for the conditioned soul and whatever would help that. And if devotees would do things that he felt were like compromises, if they said, but Prabhupada, this helps, and he'd say, okay, you know, he said, I don't know, you know, you really think this helps? Yes, Prabhupada, we do. Okay, then you can do it. It's not like a sinful act, activity or compromise of Shastra, but just kind of like, do you really need to do this? You know, go this far, you know, you really need to have all these instruments in the kirtan. Yes, Prabhupada, it attracts more people. We're making devotees from this program. Okay, you're making more devotees. Making more than when you weren't doing this? Yes, Prabhupada. Okay, you could do it. That was like, that's see, see, the, see, the problem with that I see is that Prabhupada can do that, but anyone after him cannot do that. Like you can't do that, and that guru that can't do that, no one else can do that. Only Prabhupada yeah. can do that. Yeah. And so there's no room for any kind of movement in whatever, like you said, okay, uh, wearing Western clothes is going to distribute more books. Someone tries to do that, they're in, in, instantly criticized. You yeah. can't do that. That's that's a, a deviation, et cetera. How, how do we deal with that? I mean, that's, yeah. that's so, crazy Prabhupada in time. Yeah. So. Here's the problem. If you're too conservative, you're never you're you're gonna be you're you're gonna become outdated. You know, you're gonna be selling typewriters, you know. Don't change. <laughs> well, computers, no. <laughs> typewriters. <laughs> Ty you know. So you know right, yeah. there are people that like typewriters, you know, you know, eco-friendly and you know, like that, you know. I, I mean they're kind of cool. You don't have to stare at a 
that you don't get all the electromagnetic frequencies and so on. I could never write on a typewriter. I've written three books, but, but <laughs> if it weren't for computers, forget it. I have to edit it a million times. So right. the fault on the over-conservative side is you become irrelevant. Mm. The fault on the over-liberal side is you water down or you compromise or you change something, right? So again, it's all about balance. And um, I heard this talk the other day, and this guy was saying, if you have polarities and you only argue for one, it always fails. If you only argue this side, it always fails. Uh, an example is given, change versus, in an organization, it's kind of like what you're saying, change versus tradition. We can't change. No, we must change. Yeah. So is it we must change or we can't change? It's both. So the way he dealt with it, he said, look at just just look at what is good about change. And all the change guys, um, the guys that, that don't want change, look at what's good about not changing. So you recognize some things need to be changed and some things we should never change because they're working. But if it's not working, why do you want to keep it going unless it's a principle and we can't compromise? Like, hey, this 60 rounds, four principles doesn't work. Four rounds, three principles. That's what Godi Amath does that. That works better. Okay, fine. We can't change that, even though it works better. You know, We can't because we can't. We can devise a pre-initiation or whatever, but we can't give official initiation. So that's something we can't change, but we could change the way we talk about initiation. Mm. Oh my god, my friends are going to be like, what are you talking about? Three three uh, principles of this? Like, I'm just going to preempt that. But yeah, please continue. Well, I understand it's in, in traditional Goryamat, there weren't any vows, you know, for the right. Grihastas. It was just like, right, right. Um, don't starve the mala. What's the vow? Don't starve the mala. Something, you know. Right, and, like, something, yes. and like, no illicit sex, forget it. They wouldn't even ask them to follow that. It's like, that's a joke, you know. Right. The problem I came with, a, you know, a different. A different, a little different thing. No, we're going to follow four principles in 16 rounds. At least we'll try that experiment. It's not working so great for everybody. So we we reevaluated it. All right. So what's the liberal side? And they're going, hey, wait a minute. We've initiated, you know, whatever, 100,000 devotees. How many do you think chant 16 rounds and follow four regular principles? You know, oh, generous guess, 50% maybe. Okay, well, let's talk about it. You know, well, let's take a survey. We get the survey back, 50%. Okay, well, let's talk about it. What does it mean? And say, well, maybe everyone's not ready for it, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. we're adapting, innovating, but we're not changing the principle. Okay, if you get an issue, then maybe we need to wait 10 years, or maybe we need, you know, that they do this, this, and this before they get initiated. And, you know, we want to be concerned, you know, about young couples and, you know, this and that. Let them, you know, get initiated when they've their kids are grown up and like, you know, we could talk about it. I'm not saying anything is right or wrong. You just put it all on the table. So then you're being innovative without, and you're still being traditional. It's all right. about balance. So if you go too liberal, ah, just forget it. We have to change it. Four rounds, three principles. That can work for everybody. Everyone can take initiation. Anybody can do that. And like, oh, well, it's on paper. That sounds good. But that's that's gone too far, right? So go too far this way. Go too far right. Go too far left. You'll you'll fail. This is historically, statistically proven. If you just focus on one polarity, to the to the um, minimization of the other, you fail because they both have to. We have to find that center point where they both merge. Isn't it also according to the guru guru as well? Like when talking particularly about the principles and the rounds and things like that. Yes, For exactly. example, there was one guru who is now not with us anymore. He had a disciple who was deaf, and. Uh, I think he was mute as well or something. And so he told him chant, you can only chant only four rounds because it's like very difficult for him to chant. So chant only four rounds and that's your, that's what you're going to do. So what would you say to that? That is deviating from 16 and 16 rounds, but he took it upon himself as the guru to say, okay, this particular situation, you will right. be, right. you can do four instead of 16. Yeah. Okay, you've opened up something which I find an extremely interesting topic. 
what goes on behind the scenes. <laughs> and you need another podcast. Oh, I have a, I have a sound. I have a sound uh, for that. Hold on. Okay, let's get the sound for what goes on. What really goes on behind the scenes. How's that? <laughs> okay, sorry. People don't like when I do the sounds. I kind of like uh, break up the whole conversation. But sorry, continue. <laughs> oh, so um. Okay, we can hear you now. Sorry. So. Um, I had a discussion with a god brother about something I said in public. What you said, I totally agree with, 100% agree with, and this is what I instruct my disciples. But I don't instruct them directly. I have my disciples instruct my disciples, and I don't say it publicly. <laughs> so I'm just... Uh -oh. You know, it's like, and, and he was, he wasn't trying to be cute or even philosophical or it's just, this is just how it is. So if you talk to the, to any, to most gurus and say, well, what's it like behind the scenes and say, well, I have a disciple who can only chant eight rounds. And I said, okay, for now, just chant eight rounds because whatever they have, you know, a lot of kids and it's difficult and blah, 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 and a job and they're going to school and. So, and they're full of guilt and shame. And so the guru says eight rounds. So I just talked to a person yesterday and he said that I'm so busy. Um, it was so difficult for me to chant 16 rounds that I was destroying my family. I was so agitated. I was like the terror of the universe because it was so hard to do. And though, so, so his solution was zero rounds because he's an all or nothing guy. So I said, why don't you just find a number that works? You're so out of balance. And it was like right. the lights went off. He goes, yeah, I'm in, I am out of balance. So there are realities that we face. We all face women, initiated women, when they have kids. Some of them just can't manage to get their rounds done. Some can. I think they're probably in the minority. I don't know. Right. Some, but Maybe someone objects. But um haven't done any surveys, but plenty of women can't do it for a while. And they'll tell their guru. What's their guru going to say? Do it or die? You know, he might. I mean, Prabhupada said that. I must chance 16 rounds, you know. Right. But sometimes you're just, you're, you're so close to the situation, you know. You feel it so deeply, you know. It's impossible. Um, Prabhupada was told that so-and-so Maharaj is not chanting his rounds. Can you get him to chant his rounds? And Prabhupada said, no, you tell him. He's, he's, I can't get him to do it. <laughs> so, you know, but he was doing a lot of service and Prabhupada didn't even discuss it. It's just like, whatever, you know. So there are realities. I mean, if you really, you know, if you talk to people who work closely with Prabhupada, you'll see that he made so many compromises, you know, to get things done. You know, yeah. like Siddhanta rolled beaties for the workers, you know, things like that. Not that Prabhupada rolled beaties for his disciples, but sometimes he would make compromises. Um, it was necessary. So what goes on in public on, you know, in the classes and what goes on behind the scenes? Da -da 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 what goes on? Not always the same, but that's reality. And um wow. It's good for devotees to know that, not as an excuse to compromise, but to know that right. sometimes extenuating certain circumstances are there. You go to your guru and let your guru make a decision. And, you know, some gurus will just say, no, 16 or, you know, I don't want to see you. Right. Um, you may want to, if you're not initiated yet, you may want to investigate if your guru is like that, because maybe <laughs> that's the guru you need, or maybe it's the guru you don't. Some people are like, I need a guru like that because I am so lazy. I need right. some to stick over my head. And others are like, I couldn't deal with that. I would, you know, have a nervous breakdown. So, um, but generally most gurus will understand your situation and you'll work it out and say, okay, do eight now. And can you start 16 next year? And they go, yeah, when they're a year old, I can say, so, okay. So you do the that. The higher thing is to, is that we, is that people are not feeling guilty. And then because of guilt, they, they completely stop everything and, go in, in a complete other direction. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the, that is the liability of being too conservative. You can't budge, you know, this is it. This is how it is. And that's it. And if you don't do it, 
but then, you know, you're basically, you know, chalking a path to hell and that's the end of it. And, you know, that's the ultra conservative. The ultra liberal is like, yeah, just do your best, whatever, you know, try. You're just a human. You got to be real. You've heard yeah. that one. Got to be real, Prabhu, you know. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, I'm smoking pot, you know, you got to be real. That's, you know, for me, that's real, you know. So, right. so that's a little bit too out there. So somewhere in the middle is we have to have a certain level of discipline and we have to have a certain level of reality to be self-accepting of our faults, but still strict to know that there's a standard. And that's more healthy, in my personal opinion. And when you get too far out, it starts, in my personal opinion, and I think the personal opinion of every psychologist in the universe, to be quite unhealthy. And it's almost, to me, like a disease when you get too far out. But some people are just born like that. That's how they are. They cannot, they're ultra conservative, ultra liberal, you, you, you know, and so it would be really good if they understood that so they could try to balance it. And a lot of them just think, no, reality is conservative, reality is liberal. But that's your reality. That you know, they've done brain scans, and this scan shows this is oh, well, that's a liberal brain, that's a conservative brain, and not a hundred percent. But there's some differences, or like you say, culture. That's the culture I grew up in, you know, traditional culture. That's what we do. It's also who you associate with as well. I feel like, like for your example with your god brothers, like there's probably god brothers who, th who are more like, uh, not in a bad way, but more you know more balanced and who are more unbalanced, and and those who are more balanced may gravitate towards you, you may have a closer relationship with them than Generally. your god brothers. Yeah, the, and then uh, so so in the same way, should we find we should find people who. Or devotees who think like us or who have are like-minded not exactly yeah. like us because then that sounds like okay we're always going to have yes men or yes women and and that's going to be the end of your your kind of yeah. growth so, so it's true and not true because the last statement is true then i'll i'll never see thing if i don't listen right. to the other side i'll never know what the other side is and i'll always be more convinced i'm right because all my friends will tell me you're spot on, Prabhu. You understand it exactly. And I like, of course I do, you know, because I'm balanced, you know. Right. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's necessary to slip a little on the liberal side or slip a little on the conservative side, depending what you're dealing with. Right. But coming from the position of compassion, I don't want to alienate anybody from Krishna mm. consciousness. So I want to find a place where they fit and you're asking me, was I always balanced? And I think the balance kind of hit the peak when I just felt like I don't want to see anyone left out of Krishna consciousness and I don't want to discourage anyone. I've never uh. I've never discouraged conservative people. I think it's great if that's what, what they are and they can do that. And they have this tradition and it just goes on and their kids pick up on it, you know. Fantastic. It's when they will become offensive to right. the more liberal minded devotees, I'll go, wait a minute, you know, now we have a problem. But in general, I just want to see everyone accept, accepted and happy in Krishna consciousness and advancing. At the same time, point out, this is the goal right here. This is what we're shooting for. You're coming from this side, you're coming from that side, but that's where we're going. And I, I just want to encourage you from whatever side you're going. And, and that's my fear of being too... Excess, being excessively liberal or conservative, you start alienating people, you start making people feel guilty. You start polarizing people, and then they start disliking the other side. And so arguing against one another doesn't work. But seeing the good in each argument, that's what works. That's what enriches us. That's how we grow, and that's how we get better. You have students that are very conservative and, and the all completely other side as well? Some. Not many. <laughs> <laughs> the ultra conservative are not like the most attracted to me, right? But, um, but you know, and my daughter went to Gurukula. We lived in India um, <laughs> right. up every morning, uh, you know, every day since I was initiated. Sixteen rounds, four principles, you know. So um, I study Prabhupada's books a lot. I've given some pretty heavy duty classes. 
but I don't give it in a heavy duty way. But, you know, this is the Siddhanta, you know, like it or not, you do this, this is wrong, you know? Right. So it's not like I don't have that nature, but it's it tends to be more, I would say it's more geared to where people are at because not everybody can hear that. So it's always like, okay, when I give the neem leaf, we'll just put it inside some ice cream so you can eat it. You know, you may not like realize you actually ate it because the ice cream is so sweet. I think that's important that people relate to it and feel comfortable so they don't reject it. Right. Let's look at the questions. There are bazillions of comments. Let's okay. look at some of them. Okay. Uh, forgive me here because uh, it's hard to see where because there's some really big uh chunks of comments so i don't know exactly if it's a question but i'm going to re post it up here on the screen okay uh when i see a question mark i'm just gonna post i'm just gonna <laughs> if you have questions by the way uh whoever's listening please post it in the comments i'm just going through the list right now uh Okay, here's something from Jay Jagannath because he always has something cool to say. Preaching aside, seasoned devotees are always at each other's neck because of differences of views almost always on material issues and not on core theological topics. Respect for these differences seem harder and harder for even seasoned devotees. Why? Because we want to be God. <laughs> there is no other reason. That's my next hit song, Jai Jagannath. <laughs> <laughs> actually actually said that so the reason you can't get along is that everyone wants to be supreme you know i was mentioning i was mentioning jayananda prabhu right and some of us think like jayananda was so fortunate because he left this world before Prabhupada, so he didn't have to see all this right that we're talking about yeah and i could not imagine jayananda getting into arguments about about mask, no mask, vaccines, no vaccines. Right. Women, no women. He grew, you know, I just couldn't imagine. It's not so because he had he was such a sadhu and he was so humble, you know, he he would never promote himself like I'm right. Right. He right. would say something, he would say, What do you think? That that's what he did. He was the senior most devotee in the temple, and he would sit in class and ask questions to new devotees and say, what do you think? And we'd be like looking at it. I was like, uh, did he actually say that? <laughs> he, did. he did. And he meant it. He also meant it sincerely. So I I think these, these are, Jai Jagannath, I would say, we need to see these things as like real issues that we're all dealing with. You know, if we start disliking devotees because they get vaccines or they, we think, oh, you're so stupid. You're not going to get a vaccine. You could die from COVID. And you think, you know, right. the vaccine is going to kill you. Do the math. Do the statistics. What are you talking about? Et cetera, et cetera. You know, no, no, no. But you got to listen to this video because there's all this stuff in the <laughs> vaccine. And then you finally find out what the vaccine is. And there's two things in it. You know, like all this stuff. There's only two things in it, you know. So um, at least in some of them. So. I just, I personally, I can just tell you how personally I deal with it. I say, this is really, this is really Maya testing us now. Mm. With this challenge that Prabhupada put before us of your show your love by cooperating. Cooperating. So what does cooperating mean? It means I love you even if you get vaccinated, or I love you even if you don't get vaccinated. And mm -hmm. I love you even if you vote for Vaishnavi Diksha Gurus, and I love you if you don't. Um, I love you even if you vote for Trump. Yeah, and devote, there's a lot of devotees who like Trump, and, and I don't because I didn't because he lies so much. Aside from whatever good he may have done, I don't want to deny he didn't do anything good. But it was difficult for me to see a leader lying. Right. You know what my theory is for, for COVID? What's that? Um, lying causes epidemics. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, lying lying contaminates the ether. It gets into everything, and it causes epidemics. So my theory is Trump lied so much, he actually is the cause of COVID. Of course, I can't prove that, <laughs> but it's a theory. You know, if you like conspiracy theories, that's as good as any. Right. Um, but I knew that lying contaminates the atmosphere. I've right. read that. I read that like 30 years ago. 
And when Trump was lying left and right, like they they calculate like 70 a day or something, 70 a second, whatever. Um, I was like, this is polluting the environment. You know, mm. so COVID came as no, not created in China. He created he was anyway, that was that's another topic, but <laughs> I don't know if any of you have heard that theory before. But um I think it's I think what I've heard is that lying is like a big big weight on the earth. Like uh like I've read that it's that's there also in the Bhagavatam, yeah. Right. That it that it, it weighs they that they the earth can take any kind of weight, but uh, the, the liar it cannot. Yeah. So for me, I I couldn't relate to Trump, though, although you know he was against abortion and you know and promoting things that in some way helps our helps our movement. But I I try not to get too involved one way or the right. other. Right. Um and I have very good friends that were pro-Trump, and I was shocked. I, you know, and they said, they said, you got to understand things more deeply. And they studied it more deeply. And they said, well, on this issue, this issue. And I was like, okay. So I had to respect that. These are my friends, right? And they have to respect me. And and um, that was like a huge challenge. I didn't, ex I actually did not expect any devotee to be pro-Trump. Then I found, well, actually, there were many for very many, people. many people don't and, know that. Yeah. And then um, I had to. I had to. Uh, okay, well, let me let me see. So I, uh, why they are and not dislike them because I don't think he's good, and um, I took it, Jai Jagannath. I took it as a personal challenge, just for me, my own purification, looking at my own psychology and reaction. Because anytime you react to something, it's not about the person; it's about you. Yeah, something's going on inside of you. You right. want the, you know, and I realize I want the whole world to think like me. Because, you know, the way I think is just perfect. So, you know, if you don't think like me, something is definitely wrong with you. That's that's how I think, and that's why I re that's how I realize that if something upsets me, it's because it must be that's how I think. You know, and I want everyone to be one big whole. You know, just like hugging together. You know, we're all the same, and that's actually stupid. Because nothing's going to happen if we're all the same. Diversity is our strength is in diversity. Right. We're be we're better for it. So that that uh, that's you know I think it's just for us all of us to look at our own hearts when we're disagreeing. We'll just ask ourselves why am I so stubborn? Why am I so close minded? Why do I always think I'm right? Can I learn something from the other side? Like that is you know. Really? You know, when this female addiction guru issue came up and I, on our suburb group, we had to deal with it. Yeah. We had to discuss it. I read everything on both sides. And I said, I'm going to read everything on both sides, the sides I agree with and the sides I disagree with and be totally open to the side I disagree with. And it was such a powerful exercise to do that because yeah. it's like you have to overcome all this prejudice and whatever you believe is right for whatever reason and just open your mind look this is what Prabhupada's saying he's saying this right here he's saying this right here you you can't deny he said that you have to look at that you have to process that you have to try to understand according to the way the other side is explaining it so at least i i was proud of myself for doing that and I think that was the least I could do as a person who has to make a decision on something is to totally understand both sides without any enmity for anybody so that would be my answer that's a great answer it it absolutely blows my mind how balance is such a hard thing to come by these days it's like wow what yeah. you're what you're saying makes complete sense but but when it's like in real life <laughs> it's like not it's it's the balance is not there and i think yeah. That's something I need to work on for sure, and all devotees I think need to work okay. on. And I think it comes with. Let Let me ask you a question. Sure. Do you think that devotee couple? You ever seen the devotee couples who are like seventy and been married since they're like twenty, twenty five? Like yeah, yeah. Been to Saru, Prabhu, and Bori John. Right, right. Um, so Domini, Rabindu Sarup, and Jagaturini. Um, who else is there that's been married that long? Maybe Apurva Prabhu. Purva Prabhu. Yeah, like those people, right? Yeah. Is your impression of those people that they're like extreme, conservative, constrained, liberal, 
like you know really fanatical or you conception of them is they, they tend to be like more balanced grounded people more more balanced i would yeah, say they couldn't they couldn't last that long if they weren't they would have <laughs> right? right so they've been able to manage it's not like they necessarily are you know the couples were made in heaven but they've managed that because they've managed to adjust to the other person in a way that they're both somewhat balanced. So right. whenever I'm with couples that have been balanced that long, uh, been married that long, you know, the first thing I think is these are grounded people. These are balanced. These are the kind of people I like being around because they're, they understand things in a very, in a very, I don't want to use a balance, keep saying balance. They understand things in a very non, non judgmental way. Right. They can, they can like, they can say this is how it is, and I wish it wasn't this way, but it is. You know, that's what they don't. It doesn't have to be the way they want it. They can just acknowledge. Well, Prabhupada said this. I wish he didn't. Sometimes the God brothers say, Prabhupada said, I wish he didn't say it, but he did, and I can't deny it, and I and I can't say he didn't say it, and I have to represent it. Right. That's balance. That's balance, isn't it? Yeah. Gosh. There's so many topics that could open for, up from this. Yeah, but... yeah. This is a big topic. Yeah. Let's look at another question. What is the criteria for a preacher becoming qualified to know what to say and what not to say? How does a preacher develop that type of discrimination? Yeah. When to be heavy and when to be gentle? We have to know the audience. We have to be sensitive to the audience. And a lot of times, I, I mean, this is a little difficult for me to advise you how because I, I'm naturally sensitive to the audience. And a right. lot of times they'll say, what are you going to talk about? And I say, I don't know. I have to see the people. And when I see them, that's right. just me. I have that nature when I see them. Um, I just can kind of feel people. So if you can develop that sensitivity, like you're that person, you're in their body, You, they, this is the first day at the temple. Remember your first day at the temple. You know, like be sensitive. What would help you? What What do you think they need? Um, that would be very helpful. Be, you know, be in tune with what's the, what is the way people think nowadays? Of course, you could say, yeah, Prabhupada said, no, the fugs, this big rock band came and he said, no illicit sex and they never came back. So you have that idea, you know, you just have to be, but um, to to understand your audience and where, where you're at, Prabhupada was expert at that. He really just like, you know. Like talking to people's parents and talking to relatives of someone, he wouldn't just like, you know, hogs, dogs, camels and asses, he would say, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Your, your, your children are so wonderful and, you know, like speaking to them as uh, onto their position. I said, you're wonderful because you produce wonderful children. Right. <laughs> um, Prabhupada loved people and he wanted to see them become Krishna conscious. Um, it's true. Prabhupada was very strong sometimes. And mm. Prabhupada knew when to be strong. And that's the art, you know, to know when to nudge somebody. And sometimes Krishna will reveal that to you. I would say maybe the best answer to this question is pray. That way, before you give class, just pray, Krishna, please reveal to me what to say right. and how to say it and who to say it to. And let me be an instrument and, and let me help people as best I can and, and put those words in my mouth and give me the right mood. You know, sometimes, some, I'm, I'm usually not heavy, but sometimes I've been heavy. It's just like Krishna's telling me, this guy is like, He's going to go on forever. Someone needs to put him in his place. And I exactly understand where he's coming from. And I just expose him. And he know, and he gets exposed. And he admits it. And everybody admits it. Mm. And a lot of times he'll say, thank you. you know, no one ever told me that. I needed to hear that. But that was, you know, it's not always. But sometimes Krishna just says, go for it. Yeah. And sometimes he says, just put sugar on everything you're saying to this person. Because that's what they need right now. So I would just say prayer is the, you know, and but the, the need to understand people and and co coupled with the prayer to understand is a good combination. Okay. We see a lot of the way we did things when Srila Prabhupada was here has changed. Are we upgrading or downgrading? <laughs> probably both. Probably a little bit of both. And now what's upgrading and downgrading will depend who you interview next week, right? <laughs> and the week after and the week after. Um, I think one thing we need to recognize what 
Prabhupada came, what he did could have only happened because of his presence, the way his presence affected us. But mm. he had this amazing effect on getting us to surrender. And it wasn't entirely with his words. It was more with his presence, for sure, right? Because we saw that after he left, we still had his words, but the force behind us was gone. And those were unique times. Can we ever come up to that level of enthusiasm and surrender? We can, but it's probably going to happen in a different way. And when Prabhupada left, it created lots of confusion, and we're still sorting through it. And I would hope and I would predict if things go well, that we'll be better off than we were when Prabhupada was here. We'll be more mature. We'll be more stable. We'll have more learned devotees. We'll have more um, social stability. We had no social stability. There's hardly any anyone who was married in the 70s that's still married to the same person. There's only a few. Right. We had very little social stability. We had so many devotees leave. Most sannyasis left their ashram. We're, so we're getting much better at that. We're, we're maturing for sure. We're understanding the philosophy. Um, the, the, the level of surrender, the, the dedication, we find it's less. And if you ask me, how... How was it that you were all so dedicated? You seem so different from us. My answer is, if you were there in front of Prabhupada, you would have done what we did. It's right. not us being special. So we don't have that now. We have our spiritual masters. We have our sangha. We have more families, more concerns about education and children and job security, et cetera, et cetera. Right. We didn't have that. We were all brought 90, whatever, 80% brahmacharis when Prabhupada left. And most of the grihastas were full time. So they were basically living like brahmacharis, except they had a room, you know, yeah. one room. They had one room. So there were two of them in one room instead of like six brahmacharis. That was basically the difference. And everything else, we did the same. We lived like them. So I think, you know, the answer to your question is we need to all answer that question. What are we not doing that we should be doing? Well, what what did we do that we need to re-implement? Mm -hmm. What I've seen over the years is that that's all happening again. Things We kind of let slip through the cracks after Prabhupada left. They started getting revived in the 90s and especially in 2000, like book distribution. That was a big thing um, uh, that we let slip through the cracks. And that's really been revived in a, in a really nice way. And there are other programs that are like that, you know. So, and everything wasn't peachy keen when Prabhupada was here. We did a lot of bad things. Yeah. So the real question is, are we on a trajectory to success? So my question to you is, if ISKCON doesn't become successful before you die and you have to come back to make it successful, what could you do now so you wouldn't have to come back? I think that's an important question we all ask ourselves. Wow. <laughs> you know, because we're all sitting here thinking, when do I get my pakoras? But um, <laughs> you know, people, you know, people who are starting companies and sacrificing their blood, sweat, and tears to make companies work are not thinking about when they get their pakoras. They're working 16 hours a day. Yeah. They're really, you know, and so, you know, if, if we're thinking about, well, I got my pakoras, everything's good, that's what's missing. That's the big thing that's missing. And so we need to ask this question, you know, because I think this question can help us re reframe our thinking. Like, okay, I'm going to have to come back. What can I do to make ISKCON good enough so it's, it's, I'll get my pass? And go, no, you don't have to come back. We're doing fine now. You can go. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we need you to come back because you didn't do what you were supposed to do now. I think it's a fantastic question. Yeah. We should all ask ourselves. And that could solve a lot of the problems. I'm skipping around with the questions because there's so many and we're kind of a little bit short on time here. So if our guru has a very conservative move towards certain aspects of Krishna consciousness, but we have a more liberal leaning, how can we deal with that? Can we think differently to our guru? We've seen this time and time again. Someone gets initiated when they're younger, and then as they grow older, they have their conception of things changes, but they have the same guru who has may whose conception maybe has changed from when they, the disciple first got initiated. So how do we deal with that? Or vice versa. Or, or vice versa. 
was uh, guru was conservative became liberal right right generally what we would say i mean two things is you know just work it out with your guru and say you know i that's i don't preach this way and if the guru is a guru he'll say okay preach according to your realization unless he feels you're really deviating and or find a six year guru who's who is you know more in your line of thinking who you feel more inspired for of course, you know your guru should be happy with that six-year guru. Hopefully, you know that. I, you know, it's a guru Maharaj. I, in the preaching field, I get more inspired because you're you're all about cows, and Vaishya Shekhar Prabhu is all about books, and I really relate to books. You know, maybe <laughs> I'm older cows, but you know, I don't like the smell of cow urine to be honest with you. But I like the smell of books, and you know, so your guru will say, okay, you know, he'll understand. Ideally, he would understand. You know. Um, in rare cases, he may say, but you're the only one who can do this because you have an education in this area and I need you. But generally, we want to see ISKCON as a family of uncles and aunties, not right. just like Diksha Gurus reign supreme and um, that's it. And that gives us the ability to gravitate towards leaders who inspire us. And, you know, and, you know it even goes to the point where some devotees can't actually listen to their gurus anymore because they're on a different page from their guru from like you say from when they were when they were younger right. but we should be generous and open enough in iskon that's okay fine listen to listen to those who inspire you we we don't we're not trying to monopolize anybody and it's understandable people grow they change what if tomorrow i decide the future of iskon is we all have to move out of the city, and I'm telling every disciple, sell your home, move to the country, get a cow. And they're like, whoa, you know. Right. If I live in the country, I'll could kill myself, you know. Um, those are realities that we have to deal with. So a better ISKCON is an ISKCON where we all find our place under the shelter of devotees who inspire us. Of course, we always respect our Diksha Guru. Um, but in, in some areas, maybe we get inspiration from someone else. That's that's quite normal. It's not to be looked down upon. It's just a reality. And it does happen. And then you have the third thing when someone says, I realize I chose the wrong guru. Because uh -huh. whatever reason, so yeah. pressure or image, like you say, I was young. So we should be liberal enough, open enough to, broad-minded enough to... Again, let devotees find shelter where they're most inspired. And right. the Diksha Guru should be very happy that they found shelter in someone that inspires them. Their disciple is happy in Krishna consciousness. Right. That's the family we want, ideally, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how do we protect ourselves from committing Vaishnav Aparad in our minds when seeing all the quarreling amongst devotees, especially on social media? I've had to unfollow several devotees because of the nature of their posts and how they interact publicly with others on social media. What more should I be doing to protect my very fragile bhakti? Well, Kamini, I was, you answered your question because that's what I was going to say. And um, you know what the Shastra says, don't take sides. But, but the problem is, that if the conversation is offensive, just to read what side someone's on, you have to read the offenses. Um, offenses are really dangerous for us to hear, even though we're not making them. They undermine faith. And like we're discussing, it, if you hear someone offending another devotee, it causes you to offend the devotee who's making the offense, doesn't it? So I think you kind of answered your question. Stay away as much as you can. Um, I have a little I have a little thing which I call my post-it list. The one devotee came to me and said he was mistreated by someone. And then I said, he said, what to do? I said, put that person on your post-it list. And he said, what's that? Those are the people to stay at a distance from. You're on you you don't tell them, Prabhu, you're on my post-it list now. What does that mean? Stay at least a hundred yards away from me. Right. I don't want to interact with you. you know? So like some people joke, is like, I like social distancing. It's like, I can stay away from all the people I don't like. But there is truth to that because the reality is that we, we can become offensive to people who are offensive. And so sometimes to save ourselves and to keep our minds peaceful, we just respectfully stay at a distance. 
Mm. I understand he's a sincere devotee, but um, he never took, you know, Marshall Rosenthal's nonviolent communication. Maybe it would be good if he did. Probably wouldn't be interested. So that's just where he's at in this life. And that's where he may leave in this life. But it doesn't resonate with me and it's not helpful for me. And it's better. I just stay away or take my phone, put it in a fire and just say, that's it. I'm moving to the farm and, you know, <laughs> social media is finished, you know. Right. Um, if there's ever some big explosion in outer space and social media is finished, I, I would be the first one to have to be very happy. <laughs> Although we use it, it's like, you know, it's a double-edged sword. And I right. think more offenses have been made because of it than ever would have been made without it. It's it's so easy to offend people when you yes. don't talk to them. And when you finally see that person, you realize I never would have said that to that person's face. It was just it, right. It was unkind. It was improper. Right, right. But you're safeguarded, you know. And um I mean advice to those of you who tend to be a little emotional and offensive. Um write it out but don't send it. We do that so much. Hours. And you know what I found when I've done that is um, when I edited it, I was usually editing out all the adjectives. <laughs> you know, right. Then the words, you know, or just modifying ridiculous to, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea. And, you know, you know, um, disturbance to um, something like that's uh, problematic, you know. So, you know, because when you get emotional, then it's not right. And the, the other thing that I reflect on is, okay, I'm a devotee, you know. I'm supposed to speak sweetly, even though I speak truthfully. That's yeah. a principle. Sugar-coated. Yes. Sugar-coating is not a compromise. It's actually a principle. And if you want someone to listen to you, you know, you better know how to speak. So, no, but I said the truth. And Prabhupada answered that in a letter. He said, that's useless that you said the truth that they didn't listen. What's the point of that? Right. Well, I gave the shot and just didn't get it in their arm. You know, or, or I gave the shot, but it all squirted out. But I gave the shot. What's the point? So Prabhupada said, you have to learn the art of both. And I think that's important for people when they're emotional and they're, you know, voicing their opinion that, you know, try to, you know, say it in a way that can be appreciated. Because what's the point if you say right. it? And no one appreciates it. Okay. Brilliant point. Thank you. Uh, how can we encourage people in our circle of influence to be more balanced and see in grays instead of black and white? That's a great okay. question. Shyam like show I have some bad news for you. <laughs> You're standing up, sit down. If you might want to get some paper tissues, you know, because it's gonna make you cry. This is what I read. One sixth of the population has a brain that only can see black or white. They can't see gray. It's not possible. And if you start thinking about the people you you know, you might go, oh, that's why they're like that. I never understood why they were so... And I tr always try to explain, but we need to understand this and that. And they're always like, no, it's this. Why? Because the brain can't function. So that's, you know, like... A lot of people out there, one sixth, you know, that's a lot of people. Mm. Um, at least if those people could understand that that's how they see the world, that there is a part that they don't see, that their brain just is unable to see, it would help them. And so if you if you have a tendency to be, you just your thinking is not nuanced, no matter what anybody says, you don't budge, you just have one way of thinking, you're probably like that. The other interesting thing is that what you believe today, you could believe the opposite 10 years from now. So um, that's also good to know. And then the last thing I would say is what we said before. The, the goal is to cooperate. So let's interact in a way that we, in which we can cooperate. And so if it means that I have to bend a little way this way or that way, or be a little more understanding or compromising, 
but it's going to produce the goal of a better relationship and a better ISKCON. Why would I want to hold on to my position at the cost of destroying relationships, destroying unity, destroying cooperation? When Prabhupada said those things are so important, it doesn't make sense. Now the people say, no, it's Siddhanta, it's truth. But Prabhupada said, cooperation, that's the, that, that we can say that for Prabhupada, that was a higher truth than dividing over Siddhanta. Right. faction over Siddhanta isn't isn't the higher Siddhanta to stay together and work it out and, yeah. and come together and see, you know, female Diksha Guru, not how can we work out the best of both worlds and work this through so we can all be satisfied? Isn't that better? That's to me in my in my world, that's just plain white, that's plain vanilla emotional maturity. That's all it is. <laughs> right. Right. That's the way I see it. You know, you may think I'm wrong, but I just see it. That's mature adult interaction of, of two people coming together maturely, which is what you have to do to have a good marriage. Right. Isn't it? You yeah. have to be able to compromise. You have to be able to understand the needs of another person. And that's the same thing we have to do. Try to understand their point of view. What are the needs behind it? Like, what's the needs behind the people who want female Diksha Gurus? What's the needs behind the people who don't? The more you understand. So, so I would say, you know, tell those people, amongst other things I said, try to understand the needs of the other people. Great. One last question. Yes. Uh, how to cooperate with devotees when they're the most sensitive people to any kind of feedback and get offended a lot easier than regular people. <laughs> Tricky Somehow one. Somehow you have, we have to, I just gave a talk today about creating culture. And the easiest way to give feedback is to create a culture which in which everyone is willing to be, everyone who's working on the team is willing to be accountable. Like that's a requirement to work on the team. If, if Ananda, if you're talking about working within a team, this is easy. If you're talking about individuals, that's going to be, that's going to be more difficult. So let's start with the team. We're a good team. Ananda and I and Namras are forming a team. We're going to do A, B, and C. And we say, okay, so how's this team going to work? And say, well, we have some principles. And one thing is we want to be accountable to one another. So whatever we say we're going to do, we're going to do. And when we discuss, we're going to be empathic. And um, we're, we're not going to criticize behind back. If we have an issue, we're going to go, you know, like I said, you agree, we agree, we agree. Once we agree, then now we've agreed for feedback. Now you agree. So it's like when I say, hey, Ananda, you know, you came late to a meeting and we agree that we'd be on time. You know, that's like, you have to stop doing that. It's not right. And because you've agreed, you just, you just say, thank you. Yeah, I, I apologize for that because that's part of our agreement. So that's how you get around it on an official level. On an individual level, um, don't give feedback while the problem is happening. Wait. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, that, that really makes it easier. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it depends what you're giving feedback on. They 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 have to feel like you're on their side. You're on their team. Um, Nonviolent communication. Yeah, you have to understand their needs. If people have low self-esteem, severely low self-esteem, you may fail no matter what you do. So you have to know that. You can ask them and say, so let's say, Ananda, let's say it was me and you. And you're like super sensitive. And every time I say anything, you're like, you're just defending yourself. And say, there's Ananda, there's something I noticed that you did. And I want to talk about it, but I don't know. I don't want to offend you. And I don't mean to offend you. And I think it's actually in your interest. But I don't know how to tell you because I know you're a sensitive person. Can, can you like tell me, you know, what's the best way to approach you on it? You know, and you might say, well, what is it or what's it about? And we start talking and, and say, well, you know, I, I, you might say, well, I need to know that you're not trying to, you know, punch my false ego. And you're really, I need to know that to feel that you're empathetic to how I feel about things. And like, and so, you know, kind of work around it. That's always, it's always good to ask people 
how you know I need to do this with you, but I I feel like it's it's really difficult, and, and I'm sensitive to that. And I'm not putting you down for being sensitive, but if I I, I need to, we need to discuss something, and I don't want you to take it the wrong way. How can I present it? That can that's at least one way. And of course, we always say you know praise before you give feedback. Another another system you can use, which is different, it may not solve the problem every time, is to ask people, say, we want to we want to start a program. We want to ask everyone how they think they can improve. And then we'll have three people help you. So you create like little teams. So right. you, me, Nam, Ross, and Jai Jagannath, we have a team. And we all say how we want to improve. And then all of us are now responsible to help, right? So Nam Ross says, I want to be like totally empathetic on the show. And then we listen to your shows. And then you said something that was really nasty. And we all get back to you and say, you shouldn't have said that. That wasn't empathetic. And you go, Thank you. <laughs> but you asked for it. You wanted it. You wanted us right. to it's called feed forward. So that's another oh. where you're asking and then we're working together. And so when I give it back to you, you appreciate it because you asked for it. Right? Something like right. that. So that's that's you know, those are some like things, it. not everything, but something. Wow. Thank you, Mahatma Prabhu. I really appreciate it. this. Was a fascinating, fascinating conversation. And uh I I also want to apologize for the informality from my side speaking with you. I'm I should be sitting at your feet uh right. while you speak. Right. And and uh thank you so much for for doing this. I think a lot of devotees got uh, a lot out of it. And if you like this podcast to all the listeners, please like it, please share it, please tell your friends about it. Tell them uh there's a really great podcast and why don't you go check it out on YouTube and Facebook and uh yeah and what else did I want to say? Um, next week, uh, I forgot who the next guest is, but we're going to have guests until the end of 2021 because I'm trying to get to 100 uh, episodes. Uh, Kamania is asking, when is part two? We're going to have Mahatma Prabhu on. <laughs> it, 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 it's just bound to happen because this was uh, so brilliant. There's, there's um, you know, the next level of this discussion, really, we have to focus on us as individuals of how how we're going to deal deal with our own prejudices and our own you know tendencies to be out of balance on the liberal or conservative side and how to yeah. how to deal organizationally and individually this is so important for the survival of our organization because if we you know you know the problem is we we have a philosophy which we think will solve all the problems which in theory it does but in reality devotees are as, you know, as liberal and conservative and judgmental and prejudiced as many others. Yeah. And so we have to go deeper into our philosophy and application assimilation and start looking at it practically. You know, how is my humility not showing up here and yeah. how I'm dealing with these issues? I think that's the next level. That's what's, what's really where we have to go. And I think you as the next generation will have an easier time doing that. I, at least I hope you do. I think you will. And I, I just would emphasize how important that is to create that culture within ISKCON. Of, right. of that. Another thing I want to say is that your social media presence is really awesome. I love your Instagram page. Uh, it's at Mahatma underscore Das. There are some amazing uh, Instagram TV uh, videos on there. Please go check it out if you're listening. If you're on Instagram, there, there's just a really professional team there uh, at the at this page uh, for Mahatma Prabhu's um, you know uh, content, and I really really like it. So please go ahead and uh, follow him there. And I guess you can get in contact with him there as well. His, I think one of his students actually uh, runs it, but you can get in contact with him there. Um, so I think all sp spiritual leaders in our movement should have an Instagram page where, where somehow they, you know, their talks are put into like snippets of five or seven minutes. And then uh, it's, it's, you know, the Krishna wisdom. And I just love that. It's just so, it's so digestible for someone who's just like, scrolling and you know that's the that's like kind of like the the ethos right now that the, how to get people to become more spiritual is to kind of meet them where they are and where people are is is instagram and and those kind of social media outlets so again yeah thank you for that that's a really nice so okay. uh, that's that's with that's uh, episode 49 with mahatma Prabhu and uh mahatma Prabhu, if you could stay on a few more minutes okay. uh, i'd like to speak with you off offline uh, but do you have any closing statements or anything like that? 
Yes. Oh, you do? Okay. Be balanced. Be balanced. Yes. I, I wanted to say that, but you, you reminded summer. me. Summer. Krishna talks about summer. Yes. He proposed. The word sama, it's all over Bhagavad Gita. It's all over chapter two. Be balanced. The, the Buddhists say the middle path. No. Reality, real, the greatest function, functionality in ISKCON is to take polarities and merge them in a way that they work for the greatest good for everyone. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, I'll see you in a, in a, in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, not a few minutes, a few seconds. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Oh,